Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to some. Uh, welcome to the Indian Child Welfare Act webinar with the Administration for Children and Families, as well as the National Council. And this is a partnership webinar where we'd like to ensure that our communities are aware of how ACF and the council are working to strengthen the, the Indian Child Welfare Act within um, our states, tribes, and territories. With that, I will hand over the conversation to Linnell, um, who will give an introduction of our um, Assistant Secretary, January Contreras. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for joining us at this webinar today. Um, as Deborah introduced, I am Linnell Hartway. I am a program attorney with the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. And it is my privilege to um, be working with ACF as well as the panel presenters today to present this discussion about collaborative conversations and building relationships between state equal courts, tribes, and others to improve outcomes for children and families. Um, and before we get to our panel, we have um, Assistant Secretary Contreras here to provide some opening remarks. Thanks so much. Um, I appreciate that, Linnell. And good afternoon to everyone. Hope you're doing well. Thank you all for making the time to be with us today. Um, everyone who's joining, we know that you care about kids and families the way that we do. And we're doing this precisely to show what the power of bringing people together is about. Um, so I am January Contreras. I have the wonderful privilege of serving as the Assistant Secretary for the Administration for Children and Families at, at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And I'm really glad to be with you today as we listen, learn, and discuss how collaboration between tribes, states, and courts can and actually have improved outcomes for children, families, and communities. And before I begin, I do want to extend my gratitude to the Linnell Hartway and her colleagues at the National Council of Juvenile Family Court Judges. I want to thank um, our team at ACF for helping us pull this together, our moderator, Sheldon Spotted Elk, who's so respected out there, and our panelists who are just incredible leaders um, in their own communities, in their own states, but also nationally. And that includes Judge Quigley, Judge Bostwick, and Attorney General Urbina. Uh, I just wanna thank them for their leadership and for sharing their experiences with us today. Both judges being from Pima County in Arizona and Attorney General Urbina being from the Pascoyaki uh, tribe also in Arizona. So we're, we're really on this call today because we care about kids, about family, about culture and community. And the principles of ICWA, the Indian Child Welfare Act, they do represent the gold standard for family preservation and reunification efforts in child welfare. And at ACF, we are 100% committed to upholding the spirit and the values of ICWA. You'll see the Biden-Harris administration is out there defending ICWA in the Supreme Court. And at ACF, we've been monitoring that litigation very closely. In addition, HHS is working closely with our colleagues at the Department of Interior so that we're staying synced up, we're communicating, um, and we're staying synced up about our work in this space. Over the last year, I have been um, very honored to meet with tribal leaders and with state leaders across the country. On my site visits to tribal lands, um, leaders have shared inspiring child welfare successes and promising practice while also giving voice to painful challenges. And all of those um, are issues that, that where we can, ACF will be a part of addressing. In September, I learned about the ICWA court that we're going to hear about today. And I was present for the signing of a historic MOU between the Arizona Department of Child Safety and the Pasquayaki Tribal Council. In November, I met with the Minnesota American Indian Child Welfare Advisory Council. That's made up of child welfare leaders from all 11 tribes in Minnesota. And there I learned about how they developed 
a very robust policy framework to protect Native children and families. And every day I continue to hear about the incredible efforts of people across the country who are working hard to pass and strengthen state ICWA laws to establish specialty courts that are solution oriented and to build training programs to educate everyone from judges to families to social workers and lawyers. We know that effective implementation of ICWA requires tribal state and court partnerships. No matter the outcome of the litigation this spring, we must work together in government to government relationships to support the well being of all children and families. And here we're talking about Native children and families, where we have a history of forced separation of kids from families. And we're going to be uh, a part of the solution. I wanna recognize also the Children's Bureau and that team who has worked to put some of our tribal capacity uh, work in place um, and let you know that also um, I'm pleased to share that the Children's Bureau released a four and a half million grant forecast for this current fiscal year. So that is monies that will be put out in grants for state and tribal partnerships to serve as demonstration sites to show that systems change is possible when state child welfare agencies, courts, and tribes are working together. Through ACF's program, we will continue developing policies that are responsive to feedback from tribal leaders. And we're gonna keep awarding grant funding to tribes and tribal organizations each year to allow them to show us, to show their own communities and to learn from one another uh, about the best practices that, that keep families intact, that allow for cultural and traditional preservation that allow for kinship and those family connections to be treasured the way that they should be. So we are driven to be a part of the solution at ACF, but we know we don't do that alone. We don't do that in a vacuum. Um, so I, this is why this kind of convening is so important. Again, I thank our panelists for being a part of this. I thank everyone for joining. And um, we're gonna get to this, this presentation about some of the magic that is happening to do better um, so that we're doing better as, as public servants in government um, through state agencies, through courts, through ACF and through tribal leadership. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sheldon to lead our discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Assistant Secretary Contreras. I appreciate your leadership and thank you again for telling us that ICWA is the gold standard. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about ICWA courts. We're going to talk about some of the innovations that have happened in, in the 21 ICWA courts that we have throughout the country. Um, if you are saying, what, what is an ICWA court? Where are these ICWA courts? Actually, in fact, if you Google ICWA court, uh, there will be an NCJ, FCJ website that will come up. Um, it will have a map on it. It will talk to you a little bit about those principles uh, that ICWA courts are built upon. We're going to have a conversation about it today as well. Um, I'll do a little bit of framing um, and then we'll get to our guests and we'll do a, a little bit of a collaboration and just and hopefully talk as friends um, and, and you guys can listen to some of the, the cool work that's being done and, and maybe get some ideas. Um, and I know you guys are all change agents. Uh, fortunately, we're not all together or I'd make you guys shout out, I'm an agent of change uh, back to me. <laughs> but I, I know attending this, you're, you're thinking about what the outcome of Brackeen might be what are some things that we could do uh, and, and some of the work that we could do. But first, I will, I'd like to just talk about a little bit of the framing. Of course, ICWA was passed for almost 45 years ago. Can you believe that? Uh, 1978. I'll tell you one time I actually got to have lunch, uh, lunch and dinner. It was that long of a conversation with Bertram Hirsch. He was one of the three lawyers that put pen to paper and wrote ICWA all the way back in the 70s. Um, I had lunch with my colleague, Jack Trope, who's probably on this uh, webinar as well. Um, but he, he said two things there. The other two lawyers, by the way, that we'll put pen to paper were Frank Ducheneau, a uh, Standing Rock Lakota member, uh, and Alan Parker, who's Rocky Boy Tree. Um, and then he, I was having this conversation with Bert Hirsch. He said two things that really stick with me, actually, even to this day. One, first, he said that ICWA is the only reparative law on the books only reparative law in the child welfare books. Um, so it was written to repair, if you read the congressional findings, it was, it was written to address the disproportionality, the history, history of forced removal and forced assimilation of American Indian children, 
um, and families. It's impacted every Native person I know. Not one of us has escaped that. Um, it's a legacy. It's an ugly legacy in our country. Um, it's important that we're aware of that. Um, but but we, in order to really effectuate and capture that spirit of ICWA, we ourselves have to be somebody that's there to repair. We have to be a healer. So it really struck me. One of the things that he said, the second thing that he said is that ICWA is this black ink on white paper that takes you and I to lead with humanity in order to effectuate the highest aspirations of the law. And so us working in concert, us working together, and fundamentally at its very core, that's what ICWA courts are about. Um, and so it's about collaboration, leadership, shared leadership, I should say. We're gonna learn a little bit about what that means. Um, like I said, there's 21 ICWA courts and there's five principles that they're based upon. And we'll hit a little bit of those principles today. Um, and so first and foremost, and, and we have two great judges that are on here from Pima County that will talk to you, to you a little bit about the first principle, judicial leadership. Uh, training is a component of it. Of course, we need to know the letter, the black letter law and the spirit of the law. So those training components are really critical in making sure that we're getting it right. Uh, number three, that we need data collection. So how do we know, how do we know that there is a there's an issue? How do we know that we're making progress? How do we know that we're getting some success? You know, so those are some things that uh, not only the number, not only addressing number, um, but also the qualitative aspects of it. How are families feeling about going through that process? Um, how can we reflect upon that? Number four, tribal collaboration. And so uh, ICWA courts, that's the secret sauce of, of ICWA courts is that the high level of tribal collaboration, you're gonna hear a lot about that today. Um, and then the fifth principle is that we actually want gold standard work. Uh, and so we need, and what we've interpreted that to mean and what we see that to mean on the ground is that it means cultural humility. That we engage with families with cultural humility, that we have a listen first orientation, uh, that we're, we're trauma informed. Uh, and so those are some of the things that were gold standard work uh, that we, we've seen. And we're gonna learn a little bit more about that uh, as well, just here in a little bit. Um, there are two data points that really drive the formation of this work and Capacity Building Center for Fort did a study many years ago now, uh, four years ago probably, uh, feels like 20 years ago with COVID, right? Uh, <laughs> so a few years back, they did a study and there's two data points that really jump off the, the page of that uh, research that they did when they assessed five ICWA courts is number one, um, if tribes are appear at the first hearing, it reduces the amount of time a child is in care by 125 days. It's almost four months in care. So there's significant uh, outcomes when a tribe is in the room. It increases compliance, uh, check mark compliance uh, with ICWA. And then the second thing, and this is the number one indicator for unification. So if you want to reunify children with their families quickly, engaging tribes. And number two is that you want to engage mothers, Indian mothers, actually, indigenous mothers. Uh, Indigenous fathers as well, but the, the, the stats showed us showed that uh, engagement with Indian moms. And so that's really key and critical of uh, their engagement in courts. Um, this work is so important. Um, and I, I know that you are lovers of ICWA that are on this. Um, Assistant Secretary talked to us a little bit about the, the gold standard of child welfare and what that means and what I always think of. Um, my last point here is what I always think of when I think about the gold standards is I think is these concentric circles. Uh, and when we have a child within those concentric circles, that child will grow up, grow up with resiliency. They'll grow, grow up connected. They'll grow up with culture. They'll grow up with all these protections. You know, we can't really stop the storms of life from coming. We all know that from COVID, actually. The pandemic probably impacted all of us in some way or not. Those are some things that we really can't control. But when we're connected to family, community, and culture, we can have some resiliency. When those tough times happen, we can call family, we can call friends, we can look to our culture. Um, and so those are some really important things that all children need to grow up with. Um, and I dare say probably all 173 of us that are on this call today grew up with that. Maybe it was just one person in your life that says, I love you, keep going, try again, Come give me a hug. Um, so those are those are some critical things that all children need. And so we're going to learn about ICWA courts. Um, the first question, well, I'm going to have my panelists actually introduce themselves. Um, 
And so the first question I do want them to answer is I want to know somebody in your life. Um, so after you introduce yourself, I want to know somebody in, in your life, an adult, that when you were growing up, that taught you about empathy, that taught you about compassion, uh, that really helped guide you to the place that you are today. So if you could reflect on an adult in your life, maybe it was your parents, maybe it was a relative, maybe it was a community member, somebody that mentored you and, and said, I love you. Uh, who was that person in your life? And so um, we'll just do, introduce yourself, tell us your position and where you're calling from. Um, <laughs> and then and we'll start our interview. We'll go with you, Judge Quigley, if that's okay. Sure. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon uh, or good morning if it's, it's not yet lunchtime in your area. Um, my name is Kathleen Quigley, and I am a, uh, a judge in Pima County in Tucson, Arizona. I actually am at the juvenile court. I have been privileged to be here for a number of years, and I've always been in this line of work, and I am so thankful. I just love this work. I love the passion. I love the energy in it. Um, um, and as a child, I would probably say my mom, I think because she had, she had compassion, she had empathy, she had openness. And the one thing she did not do was judge. She really was open to everybody and everything. And I admired her as a, as a role model. Unfortunately, I still have her and she continues to be quite an inspiration today. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, Judge Bostwick, can we go with you next? Hi, I'm Janet Bostwick. It's an honor to be here with you. And I'm very honored to have the opportunity to do ICWA court here with Judge Quigley and others. I was born and raised in Tucson, and the role model I have is my mother as well. A woman of the Great Depression, right? So I think one of the things about my mom that, that makes me answer with her is the, the true answer, though I was fortunate to know a lot of, of good people influencing me, is what I learned about her later after they moved out here from the Midwest and wrangled us for kids, is um, the things that she didn't have that I didn't know she didn't have. For example, growing up in the depression, dad was a furniture maker and you know a, a piano tuner. People didn't do that in the depression and get for pianos tuned. So I know she struggled. So it gives me perspective as I found that out on why she was so proud to take me to the dentist or to buy us a new pair of shoes and school dresses at the beginning of the year. Um, I also learned through her about doing for others. Um, that was a phrase she used. And, and after she was gone, after she'd gone back to work, working nights in the hospital, she was a nurse, didn't get to go to college, but a hardworking nurse, and taught me about, you can, you can be self-sufficient as a woman and, and earn your own money, and you should go for it, Janet, do whatever you want. But I would learn from others after she was gone, like from my elementary school, how was your mom? Did you know that she did this for me? Or did you know that she used to take somebody home every day from school because they didn't, their mom couldn't and all these sorts of things are the way she helped people. She had a fierceness and a kindness that are great and, and that's been a good influence on me. It applies here, I think, to equal work. We can always do better and my mom showed that. So thanks. Oh, that's so beautiful. Thank you so much. Where would we be all be without our mothers, right? So thank you so much for showing that. Uh, <laughs> good, Alf, Alfred, <laughs> how are you doing? Uh, could you introduce yourself and Tell us about somebody that really inspired you. Thank you, um, Sheldon. Good afternoon. My name is Fred Urbina. I'm the Attorney General with the Bosco Yaki Tribe. Um, I'm on the reservation right now. And um, it's an honor to be here with you all and to work with uh, Pima County ICWA Court and uh, the Assistant Secretary ACF, the BIA, Casey Family Programs and NIJA National Council of Juvenile Family Court Judges. Um, I'm gonna stick with the theme here. Um, the most important person um, in my life um, growing up and, and um, as I got older for sure uh, was my mother. She had a positive impact on, on myself growing up. I, I grew up in a abusive um, home with, with an alcoholic father. Um, my mother was always there for me. She was um, my protector, uh, the person I, I, I relied on. Uh, she provided that support that I needed growing up as a young male uh, on, the, on the south side of Tucson. So um, the, the, the theme is certainly appropriate as we talk about um, Indian Child Welfare Act and the, the important people we interact with on a daily basis are our moms 
our fathers um, and and the families that that we work with, uh, the foster families, the, the, that person that um, helps us through life um, is is certainly the reason why I'm here, the reason I do what I do. Um, without her, I don't know where I would be. Um, she is still with us and she's um, she's still a big part of my life and, and um, it's 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 why I'm here. Thank you so much for sharing that's so beautiful. Um, I, Fred, I, I look at you as like a mentor and as a as somebody I want to be. Um, and I, I know all the people on here I actually know you guys outside of this. <laughs> so that's kind of cool that I've got to spend some time with each of you outside of just us doing this interview here. And I know you guys are all change agents and innovators. And um, so thank you so much for sharing your leadership and your contribution with, with all of us. Um, the, the first question I was gonna jump right into it is about the Pima Iqua Court. Um, I, I wanna know the origin story of it, how did it come about? How, how did you guys see the need of, of having an Iqua Court? Um, and maybe even connecting to that is, how do you guys know that your ICWA court is, is working? I found this quote on your guys' website on the Pima County a Juvenile Court website on the ICWA court website. So if you even Google that, you'll find this, this web, website on the Pima court. There's a great quote uh, that says, the ICWA team's work has informed the public about ICWA court's role and place in the community. The collaborative process has been paramount in building and promoting the tribal and public trust and confidence in a court system that is fair, just, and accessible. So tell us a little bit about that and how that came together, the collaboration, um, and really to, to get where you guys are at today. Um, so uh, whoever wants to jump in. So I can start. So um, when I started here at the juvenile court, when I first started taking on dependency cases, um, I was aware of ICWA. I think most of the judges in our court, we now, I think there were 12 at the time, we now have 14 judicial officers in our court in uh, dependency and child welfare. And I was aware of it. And so I had a case and I was going through the case and we were, it was not my case, I inherited it. And I were going through it and we're heading towards severance. And as I dig into the case, I look back at the very beginning and ICWA applied, but nobody ever applied it. And uh, so the tribe wasn't involved, it wasn't intervened. And I have to tell you, we are so fortunate in Pima County. We have uh, uh, Attorney General Urbina's tribe, Paswiyaki, and we have the Tonorum tribe as well. And they always have traditionally intervened in cases where their family members were in involved and their tribal members were involved. But this was a case where it wasn't one of those tribes. And so we had to go, kind of go back. And then I thought, started thinking, well, we should do a training on ICWA because I judges just felt uncomfortable. So I started doing a training, it actually ended up becoming a statewide training. I think there really was a need for it. This was way back in 2009, 2010. Um, and so it got involved that way and started becoming more involved with it, started partnering with Judge Hart from Gila River Indian Community on various aspects. Um, and so uh, really made an effort to look at ICWA and do it myself, uh, but there was no opportunity for ICWA court. Um, I started working more closely with uh, Jennifer Espino, who is actually now actually one of our judges, who was uh, Tono Autumn's attorney, and um, at that time, Tamara Walters with Paswell Yaki, who's since retired, and met with them in about 2014 or so and said, hey, because uh, I'd heard about this concept about equal court, I said, what do you think? So we met, we had lunch, we talked about it, and they decided maybe not right yet, I think in part because the tribes were really pulled all over the state to various courts and they were really feeling overwhelmed. So feeling like having to put some effort would be not possible for them. Well then Sheldon, who I admire so much, uh, came into the picture and on a state level, we had established, Judge Hart and I had asked if they wanted to establish, we have a tribal state forum in Arizona federal tribal state forum. And Judge uh, Hart and I had gone to them and said, well, you're a state tribal federal forum, you really should have an ICWA subcommittee. So they liked the idea and we established the ICWA subcommittee. I think Judge Hart and I have now co-chaired that for about 12 years. But the beauty of that is we pulled together tribes, we pulled together attorneys, we pulled together the AG, we pulled together our, our administrative office of the courts to put this ICWA committee together. And one of the things that we had done was a state tribal, uh, as a state uh, tribe, I'm sorry, a tribal and state judge 
uh, meeting. And we, we, I think we had three or four of those where we brought tribal judges in and then the state judges in and just talked about various issues. Well, as a part of that, um, we had one of those and Sheldon was from was with Casey family and he was invited to come speak and brought the concept forward again about ICWA courts. And this was 2019 and like January, I think when we did this. And so, uh, and he offered assistance. So I, at that time I was fortunate enough to be the presiding judge here at our court. So um, I thought, this is a great idea. This is what we need. Went back to the tribe, said, what do you think? They said, yes, we are ready. And so we pulled together a team. And so one of the other questions is like what some of the challenges. So one of the things I thought was really important is to get our court administrator on board. So I went to our court administrator who was who was in favor of it at the time. And then we put together a team, someone from TO, someone from PY, the AG's office. We didn't get to include someone from the Department of Child Safety because we were limited on the numbers. And Sheldon invited us to a meeting in, uh, in Denver to talk about with other equal courts how to put this together. And frankly, that's where it launched. That meeting was in September of 2019, and our ICWA court launched in January of 2020. So, and it's been, uh, we're now three years in. Wow, it's right at the beginning of the pandemic. Yes. How did that play into it, actually? And uh, I know Judge Bostwick, he kind of came on to the ICWA court. By when when were you appointed to the bench and, and, and took on this assignment? <laughs> I was appointed to the bench in 2016, and I came over to this bench in the midst of the pandemic. So we three years ago in July, never saw a lawyer for a while, heard a lot of voices of names I didn't know, and got to know people in a different way. Um, but I think that there have been some things about that fact that have been helpful to ICWA Court. As you know, the, the, the goal is always to collaborate more and learn more and get more people in the courtroom. And we do know that we, not just because of ICWA court, but because of virtual hearings, we had more fathers attending, in addition to the moms who went up a little, but more fathers attending. And out-of-state tribes could be present more easily. And we had a really excellent opportunity there to test that tool for use with collaboration in general and whether it can help results in gold standard in ICWA. So it's been a challenge, but it's been a good challenge. And I, I think, Sheldon, that's been a positive part of it. So now we have in-person as well, but for example, today, a very substantive participation of a tribe from out, out of town here in a contested hearing that we're in the middle of because of the video and the upgrades we've made and they can be here just as if they were present. It's been wonderful that way. So much more collaborating and work to do. And that's also the challenge of ICWA Court. We always wanna get better and not say we're done. Always working on processes and improvements with help from others. Maybe can you tell me a little bit, and I know Judge Quigley brought it up just a little bit about the kind of the back, the things that you probably don't see, the court administration aspects of ICWA court, of maybe centralizing the dockets, if that's some things that you're doing. Um, I know you you guys have done a lot of model orders, um, a lot of form development. Um, and why is that important? And maybe tell us a little bit about the behind the scenes things that maybe we're not aware of. I don't know if you want to start it out, Catherine. Sure, I could start it out. So, you know, one of the challenges when starting this was is how do we start it? Uh, uh, one of our first issues was we had 14 judges. We're a one judge court. So it's one family, one judge. And we had ICWA cases spread throughout the, the, um, the court. And so that was a challenge. What do we do with those? So we actually made a decision that what we would do is initially, uh, Judge Scott McDonald was the one that initially agreed to lead the ICWA court. And um, I was the backup ICWA judge and he was great. And he started this looking at processes and we talked and collaborated between he and I on what would what we should do. So we decided that we would start taking all our local tribes, the Paswiyaki and the TO cases, and we would, any new case that came in would go to the ICWA judges. And we identified two ICWA judges at the time. I think we have about 130 or 140 ICWA cases in our court. And so we slowly worked. And then if a judge was going to rotate off and transfer out of our bench, any ICWA cases were identified and then transferred over to the ICWA court judge. So that was one of the first things. And one of the questions was, is where would this ICWA court go really? It has exceeded our expectations. It's been pretty amazing. But my feeling was at the very beginning, and I talked to Judge McDonald about it and said, look, if nothing else, we're gonna get the ICWA cases 
before the same the same judges because one of the challenges is and if there's any judges that are on here or frankly even attorneys that don't deal with them on a regular basis and don't work with this law on a regular basis they they would get a file and go oh now what do i do and and so it, they were just not comfortable with applying ICWA um, in their cases so we thought it would be good to have judges that understood it provided consistency and application of the law. And so that was one of the first challenges we faced. So we worked on doing that. And then actually with it became the uh, the other practices. We developed PPH blocks. This was a recommendation of an assistant attorney general because uh, one of our assistant attorney generals said, look, I'll take all the equal cases. So that was fabulous. But he said, it's really hard for me to cover the initial uh, removal hearing because I'm all over. So if we develop blocks, then I'll be able to schedule myself and I'll be there at every uh, every hearing, or I'll have somebody cover for me if I can't be there that knows what to do in these cases. So we develop that, we develop removal hearings, uh, our removal hearing form, where we really incorporated ICWA in a much better way. Um, and so that was really helpful. Uh, uh, Christina Andrews, who's here from NCJFCJ, was at that time our law clerk, um, and she's a member of the Thelonautum tribe, and she developed our reason to know sheet. So we really looked at some processes. DCS came along, they developed an equal unit as a result of our equal court. They had never considered doing that in Pima County before. Um, we started intervention early on in cases. So at our preliminary protective hearing, uh, if a tribe is present, they intervene immediately in cases, which has been a huge improvement. And I don't want to take them all, but Judge Bostwick, you want to go over some of the others? Certainly, yep. And some of those things have led to lessons learned in teamwork. Because one of the great advantages is that we have designated Department of Child Safety, equal unit social workers, a core team of lawyers who represent parties in equal cases, you know, child's lawyers and parents' lawyers, as well as the tribes and their attorneys, and the designated Department of Child Safety lawyers. So they are a team. So when they talk, they can talk about a number of cases. It increases the collaboration and the teamwork and all that communication that's really important to getting getting the job done and meeting the gold standard. Um, we also have some processes here that have been helpful, for example, uh, with a lot of help from Judge Quigley here working with our internal systems. We have the ability now to have the tribes on our case calendar shown as a party, even if they don't have a lawyer. Lawyers, you know, judges typically don't have your name as a party if, unless you're represented by counsel or a self-represented party, which an entity can't be. No, our tribal workers who are here are recognized. They get disclosure now uh, and are called as a party at the hearing and are heard. That's been a great change as a team. Disclosure will be provided to them. I'm sure they're in this system. And we also recognize um, tribal holidays on our court calendar. So we know not to schedule and can recognize and honor those. Um, we really find that the more we set things out with ideas going both ways, the more things improve. One of the great contributions of many from the tribal social workers and tribal attorneys is some are creating these qualified expert witness affidavits. So not only are we really wanting excellent qualified expert witness for the equal findings to which we need that testimony, we would love to have them from the tribes, um, but Pascal Yaki uh, pioneered using an affidavit. Why is that helpful? Because we have a facilitated settlement conference early after that removal hearing where the parents and everybody can talk, decide how they wanna resolve, if they can reach a decision. If they're gonna enter a no contest plea or something like that, there's no waiting to adjudicate or move them forward with services. You have the necessary testimony right there from the affidavit to adjudicate and move forward and get the services started. It's just wonderful. Um, so I find too, if I'm, don't mind my just adding one more thing. Working with the tribal social workers that complete the circle here between the, the, the parents and the children and the Department of Child Safety, the difference they make in terms of the perspective they give and the extra efforts that they make is outstanding and uh, makes a huge difference in the gold standard here. So we really, really encourage tribal participation and any suggestions for how we can do that better, we really want to hear. So thanks. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. I know sometimes that's the invisible part of, of, of having impact is doing all that prep work. Um, Fred, I, going to you, I know tribal collaboration is one of the biggest uh, outcomes and the secret sauce of Iqua Court, so to speak. Um, working for a tribe, attorney general of a tribe, I remember you and I actually had dinner um, 
on Lake Superior during the summer. And you kind of talked to me about just the whole development of, of where you guys are at today. Um, I know there's a Washington Post article that you were interviewed in and it just talked about how you guys have reduced the time of intervening in ICWA cases. Maybe just tell us a little bit about what that leadership has looked like for you at the AG's office, um, working for Pasqua Yaki and the visionary leaders that are down there to make sure that you guys are getting the best for Pasqua Yaki children. So if you could tell us a little bit about that, uh, if that's all right. Sure, absolutely. Um, thank you, Sheldon. It, it really started um, prior to the ICWA port in developing our ICWA program. And it started by us looking at our cases, looking at our outcomes, um, and asking ourselves as, as a legal office, what our obligations are to our clients, to our families, to our community, um, and, and reporting these outcomes and, and understanding that, you know, yes, we have the right to intervene in these matters, but what does that mean? And, and how active should we be? Um, what, what is our role? You know, what does an ICWA attorney do? What does an ICWA worker actually do? Um, are they supposed to go into court and sit there and, and report back to their social services department? Or are they to be a little bit more active? Are we to wait for the process to happen and then um, intervene and say process didn't happen be, and, and we're gonna challenge um, in juvenile court? Um, and what, what could we do uh, to be more proactive? And so those are some of the questions we were asking ourselves, um, not only from a, from a legal perspective, but from an ethical perspective and a responsibility of the tribe itself. Um, so it goes both ways, right? It's not just the responsibility of the state when they remove an Indian child, it's what's the responsibility of the tribe um, to help with this process. These are our children in state court. And so um, what does that mean? Um, how can we start developing a program uh, to, to maximize what we do? And that started with things like uh, notice, tracking when we got notice, um, how long did that take? Um, what, what do we do upon notice? Um, do we wait till, till we receive paperwork to intervene or do we intervene um, prior to the first hearing uh, so, that, so that we're there um, we're, we're there when the decisions are being made about placement, which is for us is critical. Um, placement for us is, is with the Yaki relatives, is, is, it's like in the 90s percents. So um, if we can't place with the Yaki relative, um, it's probably something due to uh, a medical issue um, with, with some of our babies. And so it, it's ensuring that once we, once we, are intervened and once we're having an active conversation about placement, um, that's, that puts us in a better position to start to work with the court and with, with the uh, with DCS um, and also with the social workers. Um, we can start providing support um, based on the case plan, based on things that are happening in court. Um, I feel like we, we can impact the outcomes at the outset and, and we can prove um, based on what we're doing. So if we've got attorneys um, and folks that are working in, in counties, we can actually track outcomes based on some of these factors that we've already talked about. And so it's important for us to, to understand that. And then we've developed a policy an internal ICWA policy for our office so that we're actually um, doing what we say we're doing. Um, and, then, and then we've actually negotiated uh, an MOU with Arizona DCS to kind of put some of these uh, things in place uh, so that we can use not only um, to work collaboratively in, in partnership, but to, um, but to use um, to structure how we approach a case. Um, and that, that develops a process um, when a new attorney comes on board, this is how we do things. Um, this is the results we get. Um, and then, then we can properly advise our clients on, on this whole area and they can tell us, I'd like to see reunifications a little higher. I'd like you to, to, to tell us a little bit more about the families and the children. And so we can do that now. It's, it's not just the opening and closing of cases. Wow. Tell me a little bit more about that MOU. and, and 
I'm reflecting if I was like, if I was a brand new ICWA director or ICWA attorney for a tribe out there, uh, what advice would you give to me to kind of develop this responsibility and effectuating your tribal rights on, in ICWA cases on the highest levels? What's some of those advice tips that you would give to me if I was just starting tomorrow for a tribe? <clears throat> well, there there are templates out there now, and I think I think the MOU that we've developed and, and also that Navajo had developed previously um, is being shared with other tribes, and other tribes are actively negotiating MOUs in Arizona. Um, understanding, I think, um, what some of the issues are with, with your own DCS um, across the country. Um, there might be staffing issues, there might be problems. Um, you know, in how things are structured. And so that, that, that agreement, um, you know, it's something, it's, it's, a, it's a document that's going to force parties uh, to do certain things, right? And so, so understanding um, the capacity of each of the tribe, but also of DCS um, to ensure they're doing those things, that, that'll be the, the terms that you're negotiating where, where you'll have to, there'll be some uh, give and take, right? Because if, I, if I'm asking them to do X and their supervisors aren't going to be able to enforce that, then, then that term is going to be something where you're going to be haggling over, um, you know, for months. And so, so then, then also being able to understand, okay, um, we might not have gotten everything we want in this agreement, but it, it puts us in a better place um, even though we don't have what we want, we've got a document that that spells out a partnership between the state and the tribe. And so um, we didn't get it, everything we wanted in, in the agreement, but it, it was a, an effort that that I think uh, goes a long way. And it's actually something we're talking, we're going to talk to with the new DCS director of Arizona. We've already got a meeting set up um, after Governor Hobbs has appointed this new person to run the department, we'll have a meeting with them in a few weeks, we'll have lunch, we'll talk about it, and we'll ask for the same commitment from the, that we received from the previous BCS director. That's incredible. I also want to come back around just so you dropped a data point for us. And if we're all in together, I'd make everybody snap their fingers at that data point because 90% placement with family, uh, that's incredible. Um, that, that, remarkable. Um, there is a quote, and I saw somebody posted the Washington Post article that you were in, and in, in there you quote, you're quoted as, just because there's a dirt floor doesn't mean that a ne it's a neglectful situation, but a state court judge will refuse to place them out there, even though there's a loving grandparent. It sounds like you're really addressing some of those issues by building and cultivating relationships with agencies and with the court. What has that been like with, with Pima ICWA courts? Um, and then on the back of that, if we're looking at data, if we're looking at numbers, what are some of the number, important numbers that you feel like we need to track um, just generally out there? Um, what are some of those important numbers that we need to, to look at if we're going in the right direction? Well, well some of the, from, from a tribal perspective, some of the things that, that we started to talk about, and, and we certainly talked to Pima County about um, their data collection and, and some of the data points um, we'd like to see as well, um, from their perspective, for us, it's 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 when we get notice, uh, when we intervene. Um, placement is going to be important. Um, that's going to that's going to give you an indication of how fast um, that case can close. If you've got uh, willing relatives that are going to be supportive of that case plan, um, those are really important at the outset of the case. Um, your reunification numbers are important because. It kind of gives you a benchmark on on what's happening overall um, in in the body of cases. Um, you know, since we intervene in every case, we're actively part of that conversation and that decision that's being made by the by the team. Ninety nine point nine percent of the time, our ICWA attorneys are going to agree with the outcomes, whether it's an adoption, uh, reunification. Um, you know, um, there's there's um, things that we can we can help negotiate through that process. Um, so reunification is one, but it's not ultimately one that we're, we want to increase that, but we also understand that adoption with relatives 
um, is something that, that um, we actively support um, through the process. Um, we, most of our cases are handled there. Um, we don't transfer many cases um, because we're, we're working in state court to get these outcomes. Uh, so, so your transfer cases, is, it might be something you're, you're tracking and might be something you are looking at in the future because of bracking. And so, so preparing for that, understanding your, your capacity when you, tr when you transfer, how that happens um, and how successful you are, whether or not you have the same uh, goals in state court as you do in tribal court is important um, because, because they correlate, they, they transfer. It's the same family sometimes moving from off reservation to on reservation. So those are, those are just some key data points that we track here. Also, we track uh, substance, um, the substances involved in the cases so that we know that our families are struggling with alcohol, they're struggling with, with um, methamphetamines. Now we're tracking um, when they actually have issues with fentanyl. And so we're starting to see that, right? We're starting to see that in our annual reports. And so we can talk to our tribe and say, hey, look, we need to address this fentanyl issue because we're starting to see it in our babies that are being born. And so how do we react to that? Um, instead of waiting for the next case, do we go into our community? Do we do prevention? Uh, do we do education so that at least we can have a, a, an understanding of what's happening to our community members who live off reservation? Thank you so much. I, I, I agree with you. Those are important data points. Um, from a state court uh, bench, what are some data points that you guys are looking at? Um, both Judge Quigley and Judge Boswick, um, but know that you're going in the right direction. Well, we believe that focusing on the qualitative data is gonna be very important, uh, equal gold standard measures. And I agree with what Fred has said about what those are. Um, placement being early, placement being tribal, and also we're hoping as we look at timeliness and all the usual data measures that we do for compliance, we also wanna look at at the end with the outcome. If there is adoption, be able to tell what kind of adoption was it? Was it to a tribal family? Um, and also measure if the outcome is guardianship versus adoption. So track what, what some of the ICWA relevant measures are with numbers. So trying to capture part of the quality even though we're capturing it with numbers. Um, Active efforts, of course, we're trying to see a way to measure. We can measure that we're making the findings. And we're trying to also look at with our data people measuring how often we do find it. We have had good compliance in that. Um, and I also just wanted to mention too that we are looking at um, in the adoption area, um, incorporating maybe more of the traditional adoptions if the tribe has that where parental rights are not severed and looking at trying to include some more culture of the tribe in the adoption process when it happens. Um, so a lot of things to learn and a lot of things to work toward on data. And our internal system is now trying to incorporate those broader things that are very specific, as well as tribal intervention early, which is crucial. I know Judge quickly agrees on that one. We're really happy to have it when it happens. Anything else do you think, Kathleen? No, the only thing that, that I think is better, but it's anecdotal, I'm not sure how we could capture it um, because it would take uh, somebody really looking through cases individually, but it's it's the notice to the tribe and what and what uh, uh, Fred pointed out is so imperative. It's getting that early notice at the investigation stage as soon as you know. I do have to say that I think our DCS caseworkers with the Equa unit are much better at it. Um, it's not that we're perfect, but it is much better, and we are having far more involvement early on before. Um, we gave notice later, and so the tribe would intervene later. Um, it's so great with uh, PY and TO here. It's worked out really well. Our challenge still is with out-of-state or uh, other uh, tribes that are not uh, like Navajo Nation that's north of us and some of the other nations or other tribes elsewhere, getting them noticed early on and getting, getting a, a, a response 
can be challenging given their resources, given what happens. So that is something we are still working on whenever continued challenges, but that early notice is so important. And we can also then, if we can get the tribe involved earlier, then we can get a QEW from the tribe. We love the ICWA affidavits that uh, Paswiyaki spearheaded. That was their brainchild to do that. And then the Tone Autumn Nation has followed suit and they're using those when they believe it's appropriate to do so. So I think working together and collaborating on ideas for what's the most appropriate data is powerful. That's incredible. Um, I know generally speaking, uh, the 21 ICWA courts that, that are out there right now, I know anecdotally, and they're tracking their own numbers. There's just not a report out there that documents all this yet. Uh, but we, we are seeing higher uh, tribal involvement in cases, um, tribal appearances and court proceedings. We're seeing higher reunification rates. We're seeing higher compliance with placement preferences and then lower termination of parental rights. And so um, I understand that's similar to your guys' outcomes there in Pima as well. Okay. Um, so one of the things are around, and we've mentioned it a few times, gold standard. Um, so what is a, maybe tell me what is a gold standard judge? Um, so if you could be yourself reflective on that. Uh, and then also, what does gold standard advocacy look like? And so some of the attorneys that have appeared before you, some of the social workers that are working the cases, what are, what are some of the attributes they show up with? And then also, it will come to you as well, Fred. Uh, what does that look like as far as effectuating tribal rights on the highest level uh, in a gold standard way? So what does that look like to play on those words? Um, we'll go with you, uh, Judge Quigley. Is that okay? Sure, I'll start. Um, you know, obviously, I think judicial leadership is important um, because because we all know that judges can pull people to the table, and that has worked really well here. And our community, and when I mean community, I mean our legal community. Um, I mean our causes. Um, um, you know, the larger community is is so receptive here to that and coming to for new ideas and um, shared experiences and collaboration. So I think that's huge. And I think if you are a judicial officer in your community, I should, don't you think you should be afraid to start these conversations and uh, start meeting with people because you just never know. And I don't think you should be, if, you know, we weren't, we decided that we were going to start our equal court, no matter who came along with us, we were just going to do it in whatever limited way possible we needed to do. I think that's huge. Advocacy, uh, I completely agree for advocacy. I will tell you it really, uh, with, with placement, it's huge. There's, um, and I think early, the earlier, the better with regard to placement. And even if the department denies somebody for placement, then file a motion for placement. Don't wait. It just say, well, they're, you know, so I think those should be filed early on. We all know, I don't care if it's an ICWA case or not, not an ICWA case. When you're down the road, you're close to severance or past severance. And then, then all of a sudden someone puts forth some family member to see the child, that is the worst, that is so difficult for judges to have to deal with as well as the attorneys and parties and of course the children and, and the families. So it's really important to be looking at that advocacy early on, looking at active efforts. Are we making active efforts? Bring it up at cases, bring it up at the review hearings. Don't wait, bring it up outside of the courtroom. One of the benefits that we've seen in ours is that the Department of Child Safety um, social workers and the tribal social workers are working so closely together. The Our DCS workers are now copying the tribal social worker on every email they send to a parent. They include them in conversations. They invite them to TTM. They're not an afterthought anymore. They're, they're, oh wait, I need to talk to them first. And they're reaching out to them for advice. And I think that's really helpful. So I think we've seen a lot of benefits there. So that advocacy plays out across the board for DCS attorneys judges, et cetera. Oh, that's incredible. Uh, coming circling around when you talk about leadership and bringing people together, concretely, what does that look like? I know you do stakeholder gatherings and I know you do trainings and uh, maybe tell us a little bit about that, uh, either you, Judge Bostwick or Judge Quigley. Um, so how has that been important to judicial leadership? I'll jump in. Um, and I think it's very important to, as the bench, we need to create the space for the people that are doing the work to do it. So we do the blocks. So they have the opportunity. They let tell us what the challenges are and we try to respond. So we're not doing it. We're creating the opportunity for it. Same with trainings. And we've been very fortunate to have not only others in the field who are lawyers or, or, or attorneys or, or 
judges train, but um, we've had tribal social workers train as well with our groups on culture and humility and what their services offer and why it makes a difference and just touching us more about what they are as a tribe and what they honor and what's meaningful to them. So one thing we do that started when Judge Quigley and, and Judge McDonald started this is monthly free trainings, which also are CLE, which brings people in and which the virtual platform has really expanded. So please come if you'd like to come. And they're on a variety of topics, all about ICWA, all about gold standard. Um, we've had them on um, good cause to, to deviate. We've had them on what are active efforts. We've had them on, as I said, cultural and tribal services. We've had them on collaboration. And we have some coming up on uh, the drug court in Yellowstone County, Montana. Our drug court here, with, which Judd quickly leads, is trying to become more culturally inclusive as a whole. We have some coming up on what's the benefits of being raised in culture where we're hoping young people will come talk about what that experience was like for them. So in terms of jiu 